Hi everybody. Good evening. My name is Sue Maslin. I'm the president of the National Miller Fellowship. And I'm thrilled to be able to welcome you um, here tonight on behalf of the fellowship. Um, it's a fantastic turnout and boy, we've got something special in for you tonight. Um, on behalf of the fellowship, I would like to uh, especially uh, welcome our guest, Melissa Silverstein, who I'll introduce in a moment. But I'd also like to acknowledge our namesake, Natalie Miller, who's here with us tonight. <laughs> None of this would be possible without Natalie. And also our, our patron, Carol Schwartz, um, who's also here somewhere. Thank you. Um, a special um, thank you to Jenny Tozy, who has, with Film Victoria, been one of our most staunch supporters, and also acknowledgement of the Australian Centre of Moving Image, who have sponsored tonight's um, event and given us the use of their, their theatre. As many of you will know, the Natalie Miller Fellowship was established in 2011 and it was to acknowledge, to recognise and to nurture the next generation of female leaders in the Australian screen industry. We wanted to set up a program and many of the founding members are here tonight as well and I'd like to acknowledge them as well. Um, by urging more women to think about having a seat at the table uh, amongst the people who decide what's on our screens, so at the highest level of shaping, you know, the industry that, that we're in. Because unless we can make a difference at the top um, and address the gender imbalance that's still evident there, we won't get more diversity on our screens. And it, makes, it actually makes commercial sense. It drives better commercial performances if we actually make more screen work that appeals to a broader audience. So we're, we're also seeking, in addition to having more women at the top, shaping our industry, a more dynamic, a more innovative and a more robust screen industry for everybody. The fellowship, as you know, is named in honour of um, one of the screen community's most admired and accomplished leaders, Natalie. Uh, she has made and continues to make an astounding contribution to the film community uh, and to the wider screen industry through her distinguished career over many years. So thank you, Natalie. Since 2011, we've awarded four fellowships now to recipients such as Rachel O'Kine, who uh, moved from Hopscotch E1, has now got a senior position within the distribution company Canal Studio in Paris, um, Harriet Pike from Canberra, um, Rebecca Hammond, who's with Deluxe Pictures, and Courtney Botfield, who's with us here tonight, another recipient of fellowship, um, who's with Footage. And the judging panel every year is chaired by Natalie. It has another four members who are all uh, very senior people within the Australian screen industry who work with Natalie in making and judging the awarding of a fellowship each year. So, as you can see from our slide, applications are open. Please, please, please think about applying. It's an enduring embarrassment that we've not awarded a fellowship yet to a Victorian recipient. So, perhaps one of you are sitting here tonight. And the applications close on the 26th of September, and this year the grant has been doubled to $20,000. So, I do hope you'll think about uh, tonight, though, I'm thrilled to be able to introduce Melissa Silverstone, um, who will be presenting her talk, The Status of Women in Hollywood. And I've just had the pleasure of spending a day with um, Melissa, and she is an absolute dynamo. And I have to say, here in Australia, you could not help be um, aware of the increasing dialogue that's coming out of Hollywood, that's been coming out of Cannes Film Festival, the spotlight squarely on the gender imbalance in the, uh, the Hollywood studio system in particular and the, the appalling lack of directors. And it's like there's been a match lit and a fire that's just taken off. And I can tell you right now, much of that is driven by Melissa Silverstein and women in Hollywood, and primarily through her blog and her website, 
womenhollywood.com, the extraordinary resources that they put together, the, um, the advocacy work and so on that they do, and the books that she's involved in writing, including this one, In Her Voice, which is uh, about women directors talking about directing, and that's available from Amazon or from online um, in her voice. Just do a Google search on that one. But um, I first came across Melissa through the fellowship because I was interested in the kind of strategy that she was putting out in relation to how we can go about changing the, uh, the screen industry. And that strategy was on the back of the most extraordinary amount of research she has been really actively involved in collecting the data. They put out on Women in Hollywood a toolkit called The Myth Factor, The Power of the Female Driven Content. And it's a, it's a toolkit that is, um, you know, it makes the economic case for the success of uh, women's films. So I don't think it's possible to drive change without that level of um, understanding of the underlying business ecosystem that sits underneath the glamour of the screen industry. That's what Liz is doing. That's what we're here tonight to find out more about. So without any further ado, will you please join me in welcoming Melissa Silverstone. <laughs> yeah. what Australian women directors mean to me. Um, that was an experience I had, spent a lot of time going to the movies. And when I was younger, I was hungry for women on screen. And I found them through Jane Campion, Gillian Armstrong, Jocelyn Morehouse, who's here. And I don't think you guys, I mean, you guys have lived with these women, but understand a lot of those movies about, with strong female characters in the US during that time, 80s, 90s, all directed by men. So it's a huge difference to have the vision of women on screen and to be able to see them. What I'm going to give you tonight is a little baseline. And so what I want you to do is kind of not freak out <laughs> um, and just, you know, process this. And the reason why I do these in all, wherever I can, whoever will listen to me, and I love that you're listening to me, um, <coughs> is to give people to understand how the world fits together in, or it's a global economy, it's a global Hollywood. So, um, here we go, can you hear me? But I have a loud mouth, huh? <laughs> you want to on? Yeah. There we go. Well, I work on the instruments the whole day. Sometimes I can't do like the analog things. Um, okay. So if you could save your questions, unless I do something egregious and then just yell at me. Okay. So people always ask me, Melissa, why do you do what you do? So I tell this story about my nephew, Micah, and he was four. And he knew he did something in the movies, but had no clue what he did. And he says, they call me Lissa over there. Lissa, I wanted you to meet some people. And of course, he thought these were people. This is his wall in his bedroom. And he's just like, these are the people from Star Wars. And of course, you know, I saw Star Wars when it came out. And, but he loved it so much. And so he's introducing me to everyone who knows everybody's name, where they were, and everything. And then, of course, there's Princess Leia there. And I say to my guy, I'm like, Micah, where are the girls? And he's like, Princess Leia. And I said, well, what is she wearing? A bathing suit. And I said, are any of the guys wearing bathing suits? And he's like, no. And so, I mean, I see the little things going off in his head, head and then I would just, you know, left it. And we moved on to, to, oh, to, uh, the next conversation. Let me see if this works. No, that's backwards. And so again, this goes Hollywood, you know, last year released the new Star Wars and it was a female protagonist, which none of us knew 
before we walked in that movie because they didn't want us to know. And then they sold pretty much only male toys because they still didn't believe that women would drive the toy, toy market. The good news is a story just came out about Ghostbusters toys and boys and girls are both buying those. So maybe we've seen the end of like gendered uh, toy sales. I'll hope for that. Um, so this is what I do. This is Women in Hollywood. This is uh, womeninhollywood.com. I spend a lot of time going around. We put together resources, Mishpack the Toolkit. I also run a film festival. And here's the blog. I hope you all read it. Okay, good. And I'm also, um, and it's on Medium now. And then what I did was when I first started doing this work, I was desperate to talk to women. And so I put together all these interviews of women when I spoke with them. And sometimes I was the first person, even if it wasn't their first movie, to really ask them some in-depth questions about their work. And so I decided, like, on a blog, you don't see yesterday, today. And I felt, like, desperately sad that these interviews would disappear. So I kind of pulled them all together in a book. And um, you can buy it for a $5 PDF online. And also, you know, on Amazon if you want the actual book, and hopefully we'll get to volume two soon. Um, tell me if I go too fast. And what Sue was saying about the Ms. Factor Toolkit, the thing about Hollywood is you have to make the economic case. And movies about women, I'll keep coming back to this several times, movies about women actually have a higher return on investment than movies about men. So in the Factor Toolkit, so this is for any producers out there who are pitching and need tools to make their pitch successful. Ms. Factor Toolkit is for you. We continue to update it. And then this is also what I do. I have two full-time jobs. I run Women in Hollywood and the artistic director and co-founder of the Athena Film Festival. It's at Barnard College in New York City, and we focus on women's leadership on screen. Now, why do we do that? Because we really need the world to see different women on screen, and for us to dream big, and for us to push the conversation to the next level about leadership. Because if we don't do systemic change and change the leadership level, we are never going to make it happen. Um, I have some material up there about the Athena Film Festival. I would love any of you who are directors who have a film about women's leadership, and it's broad, but if your movie only has a male protagonist, please don't send it in. Um, and the Athena list, uh, I'm sure some of you have heard about the blacklist. The Athena list is for movies with female protagonists that are kicking ass and taking names. So uh, please submit your film to that, do your script. So here we go, the facts. This is kind of like my narrative of how Hollywood thinks of women. The constant underestimation of women as a market the value of female stories, which is reflected in the investment, the appalling lack of access for women to direct at the top tier of the industry, and then also the money, 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 money. Hollywood is all based on opening weekend, and you guys have it here, right? That opening weekend, highest gross, thousands of screens, and what's so interesting in the U.S. is that everything is seen in multiplexes of 8, 10, 15 screens. So you'll go into the movie and it'll be like Iron Man 11, Iron Man 11, 30, Iron Man 12. You can miss it. You can go see it again. But that is also a way women are shut out because they don't have access to the amount of screens that all these male movies have. And we'll you know, talk about that a lot more. And so I want you to understand how you fit into this. So this is the worldwide box office. And you look at these numbers and they continue to grow. And so this means 71 cents of every dollar that the six Hollywood studios make is made outside the United States. They could give a shit about what happens in the United States. They really care about what happens in China. And look at you guys on number eight on that list. Almost a billion dollars. So they care. And the age. It's not young boys. And so again, these false narratives are what Hollywood is built on. I want to say, I take all these statistics from people who do statistics. 
I don't make, I don't do statistics. I'm not an academic or a statistician. I just take the stuff that they put out there and I put it together in a conversation, and I give their <laughs> statistics basically against them because this is from the you know MPAA, which is the lobbying organization of the six studios. They have a lobbying organization in Washington for their interests. That blows my mind. Um, so here's the number. This is the top 250 grossing U.S. domestic films, 19%. Same as 2001. Here's it broken down a little bit more. So, you know, producers are the highest number, but that number of 26, 25% has been consistent for a decade. It's like we plateaued. The number of directors goes from like four to seven to nine to four to seven to nine. And then this is even further broken down in the top 100 grossing movies. So it's less women. As the amount of money increases and as the prestige increases, the number of women decreases. Here are the women who directed the top grossing movies last year. How many of you saw one or two of these? not that much money, you know, most of these movies, aside from uh, Pitch Perfect 2 and Fifty Shades of Grey. I mean, we see movies that gross upwards of two, three, four hundred thousand dollars $400,000. So this is Hollywood. Six studios, all owned by multinational corporations. So in the old days, guys came from Europe, went through New York, went to Hollywood, started these studios, they were their babies. You know, they ran them, they made these movies, then they started to get bought out, and now they are all owned by multinational corporations. So filmmaking is a cog in their wheel, and it's all about the money that goes into their shareholders. So I don't know if you see like some of these articles that come out after a movie doesn't do, doesn't hit its target, right? And you're like, Hunger Games 2 doesn't hit its target, Lions Kate stock tanks. And you're like, gosh. Like one movie failure, tank stocks. So this is like how it's all intertwined. And this is how they treat women. This is brutal, people. I mean, our money is paying for them to discriminate against us. And that's what it is. So, and then, you know, things are changing, right? we think, there's a great conversation going on, look at what's going to happen in the next couple of years. I got an email in my inbox from a publicity person at Fox. I don't blame them for any of this. And literally, it's a list of all the movies that they're releasing for the next three years. And you know, I get a lot of emails. And I started looking at this list, and there's not a single movie directed by a woman on this list. They're all huge movies that are going to go everywhere around the world. And they don't even think twice. I mean, I, I would hide that. You know, I wouldn't be like announcing it to the world that I don't hire women. But yet they do, because they don't see anything wrong with it. So here we go. Women hire women. When you see women, there are more women. This is not rocket science. And yet, continually, continuously, we don't get enough opportunities. So this is the state, and this is where we get these incredibly bad numbers. And by the way, not so much better in TV, even though we think it's better. Women don't have access to these opportunities, even in broadcast, even in TV, even in streaming. And writing. Where are the female storytellers? I hear stories constantly about their scripts just not getting into the machine. That's why I started the Athena list, because I am done, done with seeing the same old, same old. I want new movies. I want new stories. We're all hungry and desperate. 82% of the top grossing films had no female writers. And then there's about, you know, 
how we tip the scales. It's not like these movies are any better. It's not like they're looked at any better or rated any better. They're the same, yet they still don't make movies written by women. So here's some more statistics. And again, what I was saying before about the producers, it's stagnating. And critics, for any of you writers out there, brutal. We need more female critics. Women just look at the world differently. Not better, not worse, just different. We bring our experiences into the conversation, and when women's experiences are not part of criticism, that means that every movie is being looked through a white male lens, and that affects how people are getting reviews. It's just bottom line. So I've been talking to the guy who runs Rotten, who runs Rotten Tomatoes about like, doing something about this. So suffice it to say, I won't leave him alone. So um, my goal is to debunk all these, for lack of a better word, bullshit narratives that you know keep the foundation of Hollywood. So here we go. Again, these are data. This is data, real data. You know, from like economic people, pe economists. Women buy everything. This is not news. Every single industry, cars, electronics. All the commercials are targeted to women because women make the decisions in families everywhere. All you know that, right? Um, I would say it goes back to that whole thing about who's going to ask for directions and who's not going to ask for directions. And women are getting wealthier because we're getting into more positions of power. So we will have more money to spend. And we also are online more. And we ask people online, is that movie worth it? Because we don't want to spend our time, nor our money, nor our family's time on something that's not worth it. Here's a little bit more on how women are the biggest influencers. Tell me if I go too fast. Some of them seem a little bit dry. Um, when women are on boards, the actual, the company does better. Diversity pays. This is this is really real. And here's the new head of Sony, who just had a movie out, Jodie Foster and Money Monster, not doing poorly, um, doing okay. But so here's a person who says it's a myth that young men drive the box office, it wasn't drive the box office. Well, how about making a lot more movies that reflect that statement? Now again, you know, what's, what's the narrative? Young men are the ones who go to the movies, right? Okay, that was one of the first things that I studied when I started doing this work was, how is it, is it really true that only men go to the, buy tickets? And this has been every year since I started tracking it. And here's the actual breakdown. So actually, women go to the movies more than men. So the next section of this is some box office milestones because what happens in Hollywood is every time a movie by a woman is successful, it's a fluke and there's no systemic change and bridesmaids, right? So we haven't seen many funny movies since then. So what I try to do is I woven together a whole narrative of some milestones that can you know, say, well, this is not necessarily a fluke, this is a trend. So I think most of this conversation can be tracked back to my big fat Greek wedding. It was a very small movie that was all about word of mouth. Now, 2001 is really different than 2016 because now everything's about like, you know, 6,000 screens on opening weekend. This one opened like incredibly small but he was able to sustain growth. And the other thing to understand about movies that are targeted at women, they have a longer tail. Women are not like obsessed with running out on opening night and opening weekend. But we need to give people a chance to actually go see these movies in the time that they can actually go see these movies. But now, by week two, it's gone. So it's frustrating. So I keep saying to everyone, go see movies on opening night. But on the other hand, I'm like, gosh, I really want these, pe these to last longer so people can go in the time that they want to get there. So, I mean, 
$5 million budget, $369 million. Tom Hanks, Rita, Rita, Rita Wilson, invests in this movie. I'm sure this is where they made all their money. Um, Devil Wears Prada. Devil Wears Prada is important because it was, it's 10 years old this summer, but it was also a movie like, oh, men went to see this because it was about the workplace. And so like, oh, men will go see movies with women. Of course, it doesn't hurt that you have Meryl Streep in it in an uh, unbelievably fantastic role. And I think what you'll also notice is there's like a Meryl Streep week in August where all her movies come out. <laughs> because most of the big blockbuster movies are done. And then August, you will notice, is a lot more smaller movies targeted to the female audience. And then you had Mamma Mia. So Mamma Mia, if it was had dudes in it, they would have six sequels, right? It made over a half a billion dollars, you know? All right, Pierce Brosnan can't sing for shit. <laughs> and it was unbelievably painful to, to hear him. But people liked it. People wanted to see it. It was a feel-good movie. And, you know, it's like we, sh we have to feel shame, right? To like, to go like, I like to watch Mamma Mia. Women's stuff, women's interests, things that we like, we're shamed in some way about it. And if guys like that stuff, well, you know, they get shamed too. So it feels like a time we gotta break through and just be like, I'm not gonna be shamed about the things that I like. Since Sex and the City, women went with their girlfriends they had the Cosmopolitans first. They were pretty toasted when they went to the movies and had a great time. And that one made a lot of money. Now, the second one, okay, not great, still makes some money. But I think the Sex and the City is a really good example of, you know, first we see how much these movies get and make. And I just want to go back. So, Mamma Mia, $52 million female director, right? Sex in the City, $65 million male director. So you notice that men get more money, even if they've never directed movies before. They just get more money because there is more trust in them. Now Twilight. Okay. Whatever you think of Twilight, right? From uh, artistic like books, you know, some people have many issues with the Twilight story. But let's look at it from a business perspective. It is a juggernaut. There would be no Hunger Games, there would be no Divergent had this not been successful. This is the only movie in all these YI franchises that are fronted by females that has a woman director. And she didn't direct any of the other movies. And her story is that she didn't want to direct any of the other movies. And I've spoken with her about it and I've pried, tried to pry it out of her and she's sticking to it. But it's also about money, $37 million, right? And they just did not believe people would come. Even though people are running through the streets of Comic-Con getting hit by cars to see Robert Pattinson, but they don't think people are gonna come and see this movie. So it's just like this lack of trust in the female kind of market. Highest opening weekend for a female director as of that time. And then you had movie two. Remember, movie one was $37 million, movie two, $50 million male director. And this one, they, they saw, okay, we can get a lot of women to go to see Twilight. I mean, Twilight had like 85% women opening weekend. It was like built on women. Iron Man is not successful unless women and men go. Twilight did not need men. Women just blew that one away. But when they saw, you know, Taylor Lautner, right? He hasn't made much since then. Uh, you know, they saw potential to break eyes into that one. And so this is also one of the moments where you understand the increase in the foreign gross and how it's grown and how these movies became dependent on the foreign sales and you, you know, from the audience in foreign countries and how they would you know, do all their premieres like in Japan and London not U.S. I mean, U.S. is last now. And then here's the next one. Continue to have higher foreign gross budget increases. 
and bringing down part one. And it's also the Twilight people's fault for you know this whole two-part saga f finale thing. But look, they made seven hundred twelve million dollars on that movie. I mean, I don't blame them. Every single one of the Twilight movies is written by a woman. And here's the final one. $829 million. Like, damn. And here's Hunger Games. <coughs> the birth of, you know, Jennifer Lawrence. How many people saw Winter's Bone? Her first, you know, you knew something was going to happen there. Domestic grows much higher in the first Hunger Games than the farm grows because people didn't really know her. And then you see $78 million. Then a huge hit. They have to renegotiate the contracts with the actors. And look how much the farm gross is, is equal to the domestic gross. Add a $158 million opening weekend. The Hunger Games is different because young men wanted to go see that from the get-go. They all read the book. It was a really kind of 50-50 box office experience, and that's where they get, you know, $862 million. That was the first film with a female lead to be top of the U.S. box office in 40 years. Do you know what movie it took over for? The Exorcist. That was the last movie with a female protagonist to be the number one at the U.S. box office. You know, you just kind of, you kind of look at some of these facts and figures and go, how the hell is this happening? And uh, this is the you know, Mockingjay part one. So it was the second highest movie in 2014. And then this was the last one. Of course, they said it was a disappointment because it wasn't that good. Um, and pretty much, you know, Twitter is all about now, you know, in five minutes if a movie's good or not. But $160 million, it's a huge amount of money, all directed by men. Frozen, $1.3 billion. Granted, those girls are still princesses. I'm waiting for the day when we have $1.3 million and girls don't need to be princesses, but I'll take Frozen any day of the week. Uh, female uh, co-director, co-writer, and then Fifty Shades of Grey broke the box office top opening weekend for a female director. So, so within a year, you had one one box office thing broken, and then Fifty Shades of Grey broke that, and $85 million. But again, look at the budget, because they did not trust it. They did not trust that this could be successful. And this is the kind of mantra. And then Pitch Perfect, Pitch Perfect 2. Do I have Pitch Perfect 1? Don't have Pitch Perfect 1. They didn't want to make Pitch Perfect 2 without Pitch Perfect 1 being a huge success. And Elizabeth Banks, just, you know, took over, directed this movie, and the opening weekend grows $69 million, first top for, for a rookie director, male or female. She was going to direct Pitch Perfect 3, but she has dropped out, and is, but is still going to direct other movies. Now, why I like Trainwreck is I want you to understand, again, Trainwreck is kind of like the Bridesmaids, right? Bridesmaids was like five years ago already, and then Trainwreck comes in, you know, Oh, women can be funny after the bridesmaids, right? And then Trainwreck was like, yeah, they can. It only took you five years to get to the next one. But again, $35 million, male director, but written by a woman. And Bridesmaids, of course, was the birth of Melissa McCarthy. And she blew up out of that movie and can really open a movie. She opens her movies in around the $29 million range, and that's been really consistent. Uh, Male director. My Big Fat Greek Lady 2, which opened this year. So, $18 million. So, they're all like freaking out at My Big Fat Greek Wedding 2 because they're like, we don't know how to open on like, you know, 2,000 screens. But they only invested $19 million in it and they made $89 million. Not, did not play well overseas. And then here's Melissa McCarthy again from this summer. So when you have a budget of $29 million, and even your studio, and you say, okay, you spend about $29 million to market the movie, right? You still are going to make your money. 
this is why the return on investment on one of these movies is so much higher because of the lower investment. Now, on the one hand, I want them to invest more in women's movies because then they'll be seen by more people. But on the other hand, it's just like that pressure is going to be tremendous on these movies, which is like what happened with Ghostbusters. And then Patricia Riggin. Has everyone heard of Patricia Riggin? Patricia Riggin is a Latina director. She directed two studio movies in the last year, The 33 and Miracles from Heaven. Um, that made $73 million. Huge audience in the U.S. for kind of, um, they call it like religious movies and um, movies that are, you know, not things blowing up. I guess this is the best way to describe it. $13 million. And Jennifer Garner started, started this one. So it's again, these movies are being done really, really cheaply. And I think that's what people who are directors are going to find, is you can get a studio movie, but you cannot get a lot of money to do it. And here's me before you. We made a lot of money. People want to see this. And I think this one actually had a pretty long tail. And Thea has her next job already. And that's what I teach tell women directors, have that next have that next movie ready when you're gonna when you're hot you're hot and get in there. So again, I'm reiterating this: less screens equals less money. This is the fundamental problem that women directors and women protagonists face: is not having access to the distribution mechanism. Again, smaller budgets, higher returns. I know you can't really see this stuff. But I'll send it to you if you want it. So look at the, look at the movies. This is US. The ones in yellow are female protagonists. That's not bad. It's a huge improvement from like a year or two ago. Look at, the amount, look at those numbers, though. That is access to the market. And the one, two, three, the numbers that start in the 3,000s and 4,000s, that is the amount of screens they had on opening weekend. So look how many screens. It's unbelievable. This is the worldwide. And this is your country. Yay, dressmaker. So I gotta say, I think Dressmaker is the only non-studio movie on here, a Hollywood studio, am I right? That's huge. I mean, a huge accomplishment. So uh, in most all countries, it's studio movies, because that's what people are going to see, because 71 cents of every dollar is made outside the United States. So here I'm going to give you a couple of uh, things. Fault in our stars. 82% women opening weekend. I mean, these, these numbers don't lie. This is how you drive a box off of success, and this is how you have to target a female-centric movie. Women. I'm going to date the kind of next push of the gender conversation to what Kate Bunch had did when she won the Oscar. And I remember that moment, and I went, holy shit. Did she just say that? And um, I probably wrote something like, holy shit, did she just say that? And uh, you know, to use your moment up there to talk about why we need female protagonists was quite profound. And I think it led to a lot of other women using their moment to do that. And Salma did this amazing uh, event at Cannes not this year, but the year before, where she was just like talking about like how she was offered this job as a maid and or in an inner soul in, a, in a outer space, and they said, "Oh no, a Latina woman couldn't be an astronaut." I mean, like literally, they say these things to your face, and she was like, "What do you mean? It's a movie." <laughs> so here's the next section, which is kind of like how women directors have such a hard time. Now this is a 10 minutes, okay. This is a hard business for 
anybody, but it's really hard for women. And I want to share with you a little bit of a, a video here. So I share that with you because, you know, I'm not delusional. These things are real, and other people believe that too. And this is about empowering you with statistics. This is not about depressing you and pushing you out, saying don't do it. This is about understanding what you're up against. So I'm going to go through these a little bit faster. Again, money increases, prestige increases, women decrease. Okay, so it's 9% the last year. I messed it up, so you'll excuse me for that. Um, again, top openings, I mentioned those before, and top grossing women directors of all time. Notice, Galina Lloyd and Sam Taylor Johnson, Catherine Hardwick are the ones who directed live action movies, and the rest are animated. Five women have had a budget of $100 million more. Only one directed a movie that had people in it. Other ones had animation in it. <laughs> and this is a really interesting statistic. Even at the lower end, men still have more access into the system. It's not only about the big budgets. It's about the small budgets, too. There's a big article last year on women directors in the New York Times. I thought I pulled out some of the quotes that I thought could illuminate you know, where this conversation is. And I'm just going to ponder some questions for you. So I put this together. This is how I believe women get shut out. Large production budget, large marketing budget. Opens in thousands of theaters, high opening weekend. Studious, this is what works. Vicious cycle. And it's really about trusting women and trusting women's vision. When we see director, we see white and we see male and we see Steven Spielberg wearing his baseball cap. We do not see women. And then also I want to ask, why is it all about men? The story's on screen. Why are men constantly saving women? I'm done with having men having to save us. Men are superheroes, women are afterthoughts. But next year, who watched the, who watched the trailer? Awesome trailer. So she'll be the second woman that says first woman. Oh, she's the first woman that so that's a superhero movie of $100 million or more. So mark that date in your calendar. And I want to talk a little bit about the Academy. The Academy is not the end. It is the end. It's not the beginning. But they are leading and making some change. So in 2016, there were 30, before 2016, there were 35 women in the Academy in the directing branch. 35 women. And I have them all on the list. And when they nominated no one last year, I emailed them all. Only one person responded to me. Because they're afraid. They don't want to stir it up. This year they have 53 women. So now it's 592. So it's almost 20% of the branch. They are going to shake that up. And I know for a fact that some of the younger male directors were in these meetings where they were trying to figure out who to put in, and they said, do we want to be on the right side of history on this? And some of the older men were really, really adamant about, like, what's an academy person, right? And who defines what an academy person is? All the people who are academy people who are all exactly the same. So it's like it's really hard to break in. Four women. 77 odd years have been nominated. What is yours? <laughs> New Zealand. I, 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 take, I take New Zealand, Australia. I know she's from New Zealand, but she's based in Sydney, right? And only one person has won. And by the way, you know it was from a movie direct, directed about men. And war. <laughs> And this is what people picture when they are asked in research, what does the director look like? Looks like that. 
He hasn't done that with a hat on. This is Rebecca Miller. And I just feel like this is also, Hollywood is a microcosm of our world. It's not like this has happened overnight and it doesn't happen in other industries. It happens in politics, it happens in business. There is a lack of women in leadership all over. But when they talk about directors, they talk about it in really gendered terms, like the general, and that you have to be strong. And if you are somebody who is not acting like a guy, or the expectations of a guy, then you are, I'm sure you've all heard of it, crazy or emotional. And those are ways to marginalize women. And then let's just talk a little bit about unconscious bias, which is the catchphrase now that's going on with everyone, right? I am white, I am a woman, I hire people who look like me because I am unconsciously seeing people who look like me and I feel comfortable with them. And that's a lot of what goes on in Hollywood where they are risk averse. So they have a guy who walks in and makes a pitch and they feel really comfortable and it fits in their thing, they're like, great. When someone who is different comes in, you have a whole different level of expectations and your biases just kind of rein in. So now what people try and do is a little bit unconscious bias training, which I think needs to go on everywhere, and just bring in experts who help people really think through how we can overcome our biases. We all have to do this, everyone. And you know, you look at Adi Reese who has huge hard times getting her movies made and is incredibly talented. And Mimi Leader was in Directing Jail forever and a day. And Directing Jail is real. And women get put in Directing Jail longer than men and it's incredibly difficult to get out. Paul Feig talks about being in Directing Jail and he got out because Jed Apatow gave him a job. You only get out when somebody gives you a job. And I think the Catherine Hardwood story is a really interesting story because she made a hugely successful movie and then she went to Red Riding Hood and they made her give back money. I'm like, what? She's like, yeah, the budget was messed up. They made me give back like half my money on the budget. And I was like, Ugh. that's incredible. And then her last movie, Tony Collette and Drew Barrymore was a really small budget. This is a woman who is one of the most successful female directors in Hollywood and she has such a struggle getting her movies made. And this is not different from anything else. Nancy Myers, hugely successful. Someone's got to give, the intern. She couldn't get a movie made for a decade. Catherine Bigelow, really doesn't talk about gender. Put a quote out, which is like huge. A couple more quotes. And I'm gonna go through that quickly. And I always like this Ava story because Ava was one, best director, uh, when she was at Sundance, and there was a guy there in her class, and you know, they talked to each other, oh hey, um, I got a great movie, 20 million dollars, oh I got a great movie, 200 million dollars, Jurassic Park 2, and she's doing Selma. I mean, it's just like, she was, the access, I mean, I'm not saying she wants to direct Jurassic Park 2. All I'm saying is this is what the access that people have. She's the first African-American person to be best director at Sundance. She's making a huge change now in the industry. She is fucking it up big time. And I'm just, I watch her in awe. So um, this is why you should care. And so I'm gonna just page through a little bit of this TV stuff um, and then go to some solutions. So sorry, because I'm out of time. Um, you know, women are gender stereotypes, sexualized, all that kind of stuff. Um, systemic change, okay? So, I want people to understand the power of this industry and why I do this for my nephew, for us to understand these people are everywhere. These stories are everywhere. These are huge brands. You see kids 
all over the world wearing Star Wars t-shirts. This is not just about movies. This is about our culture. This is about how people understand and relate to each other and talk to each other on Monday mornings when they get home from uh, you know, the weekend. What did you do? What movie did you see? We only also don't watch movies only in theater now. We watch them at home. We talk about Stranger Things now. I know you have it here. I mean, these are the buzz conversations. And you know, when you go to Cannes, me and Sue said she found a lot of my stuff in Cannes. I mean, Cannes, these guys just like, they're basically tailor-made for my work because they just walk into this. Because they don't really have an evolved thought process on gender. It's always about the glamour and the women need to be in you know, the heels and everything like that. I mean, heel gate was huge. And it was real. Um, and then I just want people to understand that it's really important to change the definition of what success is. Because that's how women can enter into the conversation. So you have a movie like Winter's Bone, it made $16 million and it cost $2 million. And it entered into the Oscar conversation and that's great. But again, nobody talks about these movies as like milestones of success when they are. So this is where we are now, right? How do we take this conversation to the next level? So we put together some like thoughts on, you know, what we can do. Um, how all of us can be a part of the change. Demand equal distribution of funding. The Rooney Rule, for those of you who don't know it is, because it's, it's a thing that happened in the US when they had no African American men who were coaching football teams. And so this rule was you had to interview at least one man of color. Of course, they would never interview a woman for to coach in our football teams, not your soccer, but football. Um, and at least do the interview. So like, how about for any open directing job in Hollywood, at least interview a woman? This list that they say doesn't exist, that totally exists, um, women can't get on this list. They say, oh, she doesn't have enough experience or all these different pieces of the puzzle and make them interview women. I'm all for quotas. I have no problem with that. I think producers, when they get a list from their agency of potential directors, need to demand to see women's names. Pay people, pay people equally. That's not rocket science either. But male, male talent is valued differently than female talent. And if you have a guy with this quote, and you have a woman with that quote, I mean, Frances McDormand talks about how she's only gotten her quote once. I mean, so it's like, nobody really always gets their quotes, but the men seem to always have higher quotes. And I know in the foreign sales that they want the male to be attached to the movie before they're gonna invest. Now you can have a movie about women, directed by women. If you don't have your male secondary character in that, in the mix, you're not getting foreign, foreign funding. Why are men valued more than women? I am waiting for her intervention. I'm waiting for all their interventions. And there are simple things you, writers can do. Background scenes, don't only put boys in there. Crowd scenes, do men only gather? <laughs> Being a woman, I know we gather a lot. <laughs> you know, just like page through it and see which characters you can make female. And you know, make sure somebody else is reading your script to look at these things. I know there's a film Fatales in Sydney. Is there a film Fatales here in Melbourne? Yes, there is. There you go. If you're a director, go see, raise your hand up there. Go join the Fatales. And again, because I'm here with I'm Natalie Miller Fellowship, I have to say, you have to learn from the people who come before you and respect them. It's like we just, history is like we don't care. I'm here on the backs of, on the shoulders of people who came before me, and I appreciate that, and I know that. And so, us, regular people, go, go and see a movie.
directed by a woman. Empower yourself with information. <coughs> we need more female critics. Read those female critics. So here's my new narrative that I'm waiting to see. And when I see that narrative, I will get a new job. And just to close, I don't know if you guys have heard about Hamilton, that crazy, huge juggernaut that took the story of founding America with it's all white men and made it diverse. And so I see I'm watching the show. Yes, I spent a fortune for my ticket. And I'm sitting at the ending. And front and center is Eliza, the wife. And because he's dead. And she has these lines about, I am, I put myself back into the narrative. And like I just got these goosebumps because none of us know what this woman has done. And if you listen to that song, she did so much. She helped build the Washington Monument. She founded an orphanage. It's just like women's contributions is just shut out of history. So what I say is we need to put ourselves back into the narrative and have and just reclaim our places. And so I really want to thank you for listening. And um, you can find us here every day, except for the weekend, all the time. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we're actually going to open up the conversation to the room. So, um, Melissa, you'll join me over in the chair here. Put your, put your slide back up. Oh, that way. It's okay. Are they ready for Women in Hollywood now? No. <laughs> That's fine. So, why don't you have a seat? I've had her talking all day. She's done a couple of interviews with um, ABC Radio today and done uh, um, an interview with Philippa Hawker from The Australian as well, which is terrific because it just um, is, I think, further evidence that here in Australia, we're very, very interested um, in this and putting ourselves you know, back into the narrative. It's a hot topic here as well as evidenced by everybody turning up tonight. Before I kick off to the rest of the room, I just have to ask, why is this not making logical sense? Here we have, you know, you've shown us a series of figures where regularly you're seeing amongst the successful box office films that women have directed, uh, the return on investment is significant. It's eight to 10 times. It's quite extraordinary um, the amounts of, that, of money that can be made on, on, these, um, on these films. And we've, we've seen the data now and the number of women that go to the movies. We all know, we all go to the movies. And we've seen it here in Australia as well as internationally. So something is really, really not gelling around the business case. And I was just wondering, you know, what are the kind of cultural barriers, the barriers of thinking amongst the power brokers that's resisting a really sound economic argument? I think there's more misogyny out there than we really actually process because it would be really hard to get through the day. And I think that, um, right, I mean, there's a lot of, and I feel that we are in a real transitional period in all of our cultures, especially in the US, where the guys who've had power, the white dudes, are literally holding on with their nails at every place that they can because they know it's coming. You know, changes are coming and it's, it's on its way. And whether it's when the US becomes, you know, 50% minority, uh, you know, they're gonna keep fighting for their power. When you have power, do you wanna give it up? No. So, but it's also, I, I think I, I, I just feel that they are, just really slow in movies and really risk averse and they're beholden to their stockholders and all those boardrooms are full of men who just want to see successful movies. So I mean as women and women in the industry we're also committed to seeing you know a successful business as well a successful industry we also have to be very interested in the culture and what we see on the, on screens 
as well. Um, is the key then really about getting more women into positions of leadership, you know, to drive that change, and women just stepping up and not being invited, but stepping up and saying, I want to be, have a seat at the table? I think it's everything. I mean, you can't only do one thing to solve this. You have to do 70 things. And Linda Oaks, uh, producer, used to say, you know, it used to be show business. Now it's business to business. And so the show is gone. So it's like, I don't even care if the movie's good anymore. Um, just that it, it sells tickets. And I, I don't, I don't want to see a bad movie. I mean, as a waste of my time, I'd rather be on Twitter. Um, <laughs> which you are. Come on. But I just feel like now we live such bifurcated lives and we have so much information coming at us that we are all self-curating our, our lives. And so what's going to happen is we're going to only watch Netflix. But I still believe that, you know, people will go see the big event movies. But I think people want diversity in the big event movies. They are done. I mean, like, snark about Batman versus Superman happened, you know, five seconds. I tried to watch it twice on a plane. Twice. Because I, you know, I want to see what these things are like, right? And it is unwatchable. <laughs> like, Ben Affleck does barely opens his mouth. You can't even understand what he's saying. And I'm just like, how is it that somebody didn't say, fix this? Uh, I haven't attempted. I, 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 I was hanging out for the Ad Fab film, which is opening next week. So I uh, you know, bring on the girls as far as I'm concerned in the US. Um, I'd like to open up some questions, and I know you guys are burning with questions, so please, um, a question here. We do have a roving microphone, so if you could just I want to take a question here and then the next one in the middle. So, and just put your hand up if you'd like to ask a question. Hey there, my name's Camille. Thank you for that insight into what we're up against in our industry. Um, have you had a chat to those studio heads? Have you got any, you know, point of view from, from why these decisions keep on being made, why they keep... Um, choosing the male directors because you know we're sitting here sharing this very interesting knowledge and the stats. I don't really have access to them so themselves. Right. I don't really have access, and sometimes, you know, I live in New York and I don't live in Hollywood, and I think that is for the better because I would blow my brains out if I lived there. And I am always going to be the outside agitator. That's my job to just be the kind of everyday person. I mean, I started this because I went to the movies and I was just like, oh, terrible. And no one else was writing about it. And I didn't want to lose my hobby. You know what I love to do. But I also felt like as I was getting older and I was more attuned to like what's on screen, I was just like, this is a problem. And so I think the studio has, they know it's a problem. They just have to have the will to change it. I think it also takes time. I mean, one of the things that we're trying to do here in Australia is to set up that dialogue directly with you know, the heads of the distribution companies and the exhibition companies in this um, country. And we're really delighted that uh, with something even like the Nathan Miller Fellowship now, um, that we're, we've been invited uh, back to the Australian International Movie Convention um, in order to have you know, a, a place mm -hmm. to to put these kind of discussions on the agenda. Now that wouldn't have happened five years ago. I think it's a slow change, mm -hmm. but um, we are sort of getting there, and you're quite right, it needs to be taken to those at the most senior levels um, in this industry. Yeah, Stacey Smith, who is in that 4%, is like the top level researcher, and she researches intersectionality also. It's not just gender, it's also race. And um, she goes to the studios and she shows them this stuff. This is not news. They say we have a problem, and they create diversity programs, and some of them are terrible, and they're all. Some of them are just like mentorship schemes where they throw a couple dollars at it, and they don't really create systemic institutional change. And again, that has to come from the top. The studio head, who, by the way, there are some women making decisions at studio level. Donna Langley, Stacy Snyder is now at Fox. I mean, they have decision-making power, but they all report to men. So there's no, a single woman who doesn't have a, a report up. And um, 
they have to just, you know, believe and the will. You know, it takes work. I'm not gonna say it doesn't take work. It takes work to build diversity into your conversation and into your filmmaking and to ask for a, a list that includes people of color and women for your directing job. But it's not that hard. I'm gonna question the center here, yes. And where's the next question from? Put your hand up. Okay, on the left hand side. So we could um, get a microphone up there for next There's another mic over here if someone wants to run this one. Hi, thanks. Amanda Coles, University of Melbourne, um, expat, dislocated Canadian, who does research on the film and television industry uh, just above that big machine called Hollywood. Um, well, as I'm particularly taken with one of the recommendations you made that I haven't seen before, um, that speaks really neatly to the exercise of power in Hollywood, and that's about stars invoking equity clauses. And that talks about the labor market power mm -hmm. of particular stars. And of course, that leads me to questions around the unions. Mm -hmm. We know that unions have huge amounts of power and influence in Hollywood. I do work with Canadian unions on gender equality. So I'm wondering if you could provide us with some insights on um, what, if anything, are the unions doing in a meaningful way around this? Because sort of some of what would appear to be low-hanging fruit right. would be those right. magic collective right. agreements. So um, Stacy is the one who talked about the equity riders, and that's basically for stars like a Brad Pitt who could say, I want 50-50, and they can write it into their contract. And it's mostly men who can do that. And so they have to have the will to say, you know what, we're going to do an equity, you know, equity clause in my contract. I haven't heard of one as of yet, but I also, in the U.S., um, I think the guilds, they're good for the floors. Like, you can't pay people any less than a certain amount, but they're not, they don't deal with the ceilings because they're all negotiated by agents. And I'm going to say it, and I say it all the time, the director's guild is a huge problem. And when you have 86% of, you know, your first time gigs in television going to men, these are people who have never worked before, going to men, you're not, you're not doing anything. You're not. And they have lots of diversity committees, they have lots of events, they're trying, but they haven't really figured out, say, hire women. I mean, this is it, hire women. It's not that hard. And it could change immediately. But there's something holding it back, whether they say you don't have the right experience. Again, even this list, there's a TV list, there's a film list. Agencies don't necessarily put women on their rosters in the same way because they don't see women as long-time earners. And all the agencies want to do is earn. So these are such fundamental problems about like getting out of your stupid your brain. Like a woman could have a kid and go on maternity leave and she will come back because she's a trained director. And it's like, get over it. And she might work even longer on the other end. But we have institutional systemic biases and cultural biases of how we perceive women in leadership. And it manifests itself all over the place in directing, especially. I'm not as familiar with the Writers Guild and um, Actors Equity and all that stuff, but you know, I don't see much going on. Question up here. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask about um, how to get men to identify with female protagonists. Um, I don't know that I necessarily care myself, but I have heard that um, like if a man and a woman were going to see movies, that a man is not willing to see a female-led film, whereas a woman is more likely to see a male-led film, because that's just what we're used to seeing. Right? No, it's one of the biggest problems, I think, in all of our culture is, you know, I always say it goes back to when they give us our doll and give the boys their, their trucks. Um, it's just how we're gender segregated. And if you don't value female experience in the same way as you value male experience, then when a boy says, I don't want to see that, oh, it's too girly, I mean, it's all, you know, it's gendered. And what's wrong with it being girly? And I just think that, that there have been some great films coming out recently that are, that are changing that perception, especially for kids. I mean, this I is about it. feminism. I mean, this, everything I say is, feminist because we are trying to change the world 
This is about a revolution of our time. And what Gloria Steinem always says is like, we will accomplish the, you know, the change when, you know, women can do what men can do now, when men can do what women can do. And it's validated in our culture. I mean, we're ahead. I feel like guys have a lot of work to do. And they need to be validated in their wanting to be different. They still don't get the same kind of paternity leave. And if they want to stay home with kids, it's not the same. They just don't get treated in the same way. And I think they need to fight for that, too. Um, question up the back. Mm -hmm. I might just point out one of the um, stats that you found, and Melissa, in terms of uh, female protagonist studies, characters that drive, uh, female characters that drive the narrative in the US and the studio system, sitting around sort of 22% of the, the films year in, year out. I've been tracking it now for five years here in Australia. It's around the same. It's, it's less than a quarter um, every year, Australian films that have a central female um, character driving the narrative. So it's not, not dissimilar at all. In this and if you market. only see men as the protagonists and as the heroes of the story, that's who you believe saved the world, right? and or drive the narrative and if so we need to see more women driving the narrative but again it goes back to what movies that there are people are going to invest in as you know seeing what is driving the narrative like m movies written by women are very different than movies written by men but because we value them differently we're going to you know women's movies they talk more it's just the way it is you, you, you have dialogue. You'll see a movie, you know, with a male protagonist, you know, the shit just blows up, right? And then they're like, done. They don't have to say anything. Plus, those also travel really well to foreign markets because they don't have to do too much dubbing because things are just blowing up. They're not saying anything. So, I mean, it's like these are just like things that are just like how, and think about how women are valued in some other cultures. Some places women still don't drive. So they're not going to be taking some of these movies in. So this is all about you know, changing the world to understand that we are equal. Absolutely. Question up the back. Hi. Um, I've got, got a question. If I look at it from a writing perspective, if we look back to sort of 1930s, 1940s, had some really strong female roles, and you can think of the actors, like Myrna Roy and Catherine Hepburn and so on. Um, forward now 80 years or so to say Ghostbusters, we've got, uh, apart from all the hate that, that came out, which I guess most people are absolutely appalled by, what struck me about it a little bit was what essentially has happened with taking the existing franchise and gender change the main characters. Do you think that's the start of a trend? And if you do, is it a positive or a negative trend for you? Well, the, what they want to make clear is that they didn't um, gender change them. They, act, they took the premise of the movie and created female characters because they say we, there's no way we could have like you know changed or changed the Bill Murray character, and what and they a real homage to that movie. And one of the things that they were talking about because they interviewed the um, director was you know the fact that these are scientists. I mean. I quickly went through the whole section on gender stereotyping, but women in movies are nurses and teachers and educators, and men are lawyers and doctors. I mean, we're gender stereotyped even in movies if we have clothes on. You know, so, you know, these are things that we need to continue to battle on a constant basis. And you know that girls think they become, they can be princesses. Like, they think that's a job that they can have because it's in every freaking movie. And, you know, boys, I don't know. The Last Princess, you know, it's not really, you can't really sign up and go to the employment agency to be a princess. So I think it's a great, I mean, one of the things is uh, Sicario, Emily Blunt's role is written for a man. They switched it. I think there are a lot of movies that it's really easy to change the gender. and. There are times when people say, oh yeah, that might be interesting because we've had so few female characters that having a woman in the lead role is interesting. 
I think Gina Davis. Oh, okay. Just before you go, I'm sorry, we've got, because we're getting close to running out of time, I might just open it up for two more questions. And we've got a question up here on the right. And a question up the back there. Thank you. Okay, is that me? Okay. Um, first of all, great. It was really insightful. We're talking about female directors, and like that's the only, only the major issue. But it, it goes, it goes the way women are seen. Number one, the least hired um, in Australia is females, and females over forty have got the lowest amount of employment. And when they do, um, mostly, not in all cases. They are mothers and grandmothers, and they don't, they're not seen past that. So yeah. it's not just directing. And um, as somebody who's you know, in pre production trying to get a movie together and don't shoot me because I don't have a um, female director, but I've been getting a female cinematographer and have mostly women and women with strong roles, it is a huge issue. And uh, you know, it, it's getting women. I mean, young girls are growing up going, mm, well, I'm gone by the time I'm 40, because that's what we're seeing. Yeah, there's no parts. I think in 10 years, there were no uh, leading roles with a woman over 45. That's some statistics. I mean, it's absurd. We're all here, huh? Over 40. I mean, I actually am way more interesting than I was when I was 22. <laughs> um, I was all, you know, boring when I was 22. So it's just like, this is the world that we live in. And I think what women are hungry for is for the culture that we see and the movies that we see to reflect a reality that we live in. We know that movies are fantasies and you know entertainment. But also, you know, you have to see something that you can connect with. And so much now is it's really hard to feel that connection. Sorry, uh, broken. My question is about the lawsuit that's happening in Hollywood in terms of the, I believe, the equal employment opportunity um, and that they're kind of going through and interviewing everyone mm -hmm. and saying, you know, how, uh, it's, it's obviously such a hard thing to prove. If you interview 10 people and you don't choose the woman, is that, you know, it's, it's, it's uniquely difficult because you've never fired them, you just didn't hire them. Right. Do you think that will go anywhere? Do you see it as being useful? I mean... So it's not technically a lawsuit. So it is an investigation. So the ACLU asked the EEOC and another California-based agency to look into systemic discrimination against women directors. And I want to add the fact that there's discrimination against women in pretty much every job in the industry from the music supervisor and the composers to um, to directors. And I talk about directing because of the leadership position, but it could be any position. But they're looking at systemic discrimination against women directors. And the hard part is, and for those of you who make movies, is you know you don't get hired by like an, op an office. You know, y you get hired for a movie and it's a production company that exists for the movie, right? And so it's really hard in the States to like have you know sexual harassment laws and all those things be relevant because you're not working for an entity. So what they are, they are spent a year in interviewing people, I've spoken with them several times, and um, I can't see them not doing something after investing so much time and money in this. And whether it goes anywhere, all I know is that they're not nervous yet in Hollywood. I mean, they're talking about it, but the power that be, they're not nervous yet because nobody's really said anything or done anything to make them nervous. Um, so we shall see. Um, but I, the, a lot of the women are really excited and optimistic because it's the first time, like, anybody cared. Well, I think the bottom line is, I mean, we live and work and engage with the creative industries and we're asking the creative industries to think a bit more creatively about this. And there's no one silver bullet solution. Yeah, it's funny. But it's like yeah. such a creative, it's, it's supposedly the creative industry when they are basically the most uncreative people in terms of thinking about these issues. Exactly. But the other thing that is just, um, the real gift of what you've been able to share with us tonight is that we know that there's a tremendous resource there. 
that there is a toolkit, that the, the data is there, and, um, and all of us in our different ways can be working with that and hopefully you know, working to change the situation. So thank you so much, Melissa. Will you please join me? And, and you know, we have a newsletter you can sign up for, read the blog, if you have some extra dollars contribute to us because we could use it. I want to hire more people outside the US to monitor what's going on. I work on a shoestring. I would love to increase my capacity. Thank you. Share the love. <laughs> now, um, before we wind up tonight, um, I want to invite you all, on behalf of the Natalie Miller Fellowship, to join us in a fundraising screening um, of a new film that's coming out, being presented um, by Sony Pictures, and it's about women in the finance sector. It's called Equity. And really Sony good. have been terrific and they've um, sponsored a, um, a screening of this that will take place at the Cinema Nova on Wednesday the 7th of September at 7pm. Thank you very much Cinema Nova and thank you very much Sony. And it's been described by Variety as the she-wolves of Wall Street. <laughs> I find that really gender too. Yeah. Right. Yeah. right. It's about a woman on Wall Street who is making a deal and has to go through all the machinations to get that deal to happen. And it's written by a woman, it's produced by women, it's directed by women. These two women started their own production company so that they could get parts. And it stars Anna Gunn, who um, is in Breaking Bad, for any of you Breaking Bad fans. Great. Now, the ticket price is $10. If you're interested in coming to this, um, there, and all proceeds will go to the Natalie Miller Fellowship so we can continue to do the work that we're doing. Please drop your business card in one of the um, plastic uh, bags that our uh, committee members will have up the back of um, the session tonight as you leave. And if you don't have a business card, then please write your email address uh, down on the, uh, the paper up there and then we'll email you uh, the details about I think how they you should can have to sign up. up. <laughs> so I mean, that's a consumer intervention, right? <laughs> One of the things is to go and support, it. like she's providing you the opportunity to support with it. Like, take it. So, yeah, come and join us. And um, and if you've enjoyed tonight, in addition to getting on to womenhollywood.com, please give the Natalie Miller Fellowship a donation, banknote preferably, but gold coin fine as you leave tonight. Um, your ticket will give you a complimentary drink downstairs at the Acme Bar. We'd love you to join us in a bit of networking now because that's, at the end of the day, how we should really get together and um, make change in this business. Um, come down, join us for a complimentary glass of wine or soft drink. But thank you all for coming tonight and sharing this with Melissa. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you all.